Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. And the webinar is called How Solar Asset Owners Can Generate More Revenues to Electricity Trading. A new topic on the horizon, not for the experts that we have in the room today, but um, maybe for you. And in, in, in any case, also a relevant, uh, relatively new topic for me. I am very curious to hear more of these experts today. Um, I'm very welcome to all of you listening in today. Um, first, some general notes that I'm going to share with you on the today's event. Um, just a little bit about Solar Plaza. You might have known us from our events. We have done more than 200 now. Last week we did our 201st event in Uganda. Um, in the business for all, already more than 20 years. Um, next year we're celebrating 20 years of Solar Plaza. We do events, but we also help uh, companies with consultancy. Not the topic of today, so we'll skip that for uh, for now. We have a foundation where we also try to support people that are less privileged in this world um, with part of our profits of the company. Um, also not the topic of today. Some practical notes for this webinar to go briefly. You have a chat box on the right side on your menu and uh, you can sh share questions with us. We will try to moderate them. We will collect them um, and then uh, use the, the questions after each presentation, one or two questions, and at the end of the webinar, we will collectively do with all the three speakers all the other questions or as many questions as possible. We'll try to stick within the one hour um, for today. If there's any technical issues, you can also use this Q&A question box to chat with um, our technical staff. Uh, my colleague Bo is in the room to guide us through this webinar. And presentation slides and full recordings will be made available afterwards. Give us one or two days to fix that, prepare that, and then you will receive an email so you can review the webinar and uh, see the slides of the presentations. Good. Our agenda. Um, first, we have the forward and spot optimization a perspective from uh, by Jan Willem Zwang. He's CEO of Strategy. You might already see him uh, on the camera. Second, we have the importance of local energy trade by Tim de Knecht, CEO of Distro Energy. And thirdly, uh, we have a solar forecasting for energy trading by Jean-Paul Harman, director of Inepsis, and we'll have and close uh, the webinar with some Q&A. Good, but first Jan Willem, he is an independent consultant at Strategy, his own company. He has more than 20 years of experience in energy and energy trading. He is an energy trend watcher, very popular on LinkedIn, has a lot of followers. Welcome Jan Willem, can you hear me? Yes, Edwin, thank you. So I think um, the floor is uh, yours. Uh, let me, your slides will be brought up and so you can take it away. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And before I start, I would like to say hello to Macon de Vrede from KPN. He made a lot of effort to join this uh, webinar. He's in the train back from Berlin to Amersfoort. So hello, Macon. Uh, Bo, next slide, please. Ah, I can do it myself. Um, well, there are various methods to earn more money from your renewable energy than simply optimizing on the spot markets. And here you see two examples, unfortunately they are in Dutch, um, where optimization is performed on the forward markets. A solar park from which Vattenfall purchases electricity for a period of five years with an option for extension to 15 years. And the wind farm from which KPN purchases electricity from uh, Eneco for a period of 15 years. When entering into these types of power purchase agreements, there's often uh, a differentiation made in how the delivery is settled. This could be as nominated. In this case, the producer indicates a day in advance what they expect to produce. Deviations from this forecast is called imbalance and uh, that's then the responsibility of the producer. It also could be as nominated. In this case, the producer indicates a day in advance what they expect to produce. Deviations from this forecast is uh, then the uh, responsibility of the producer. Alternatively, it could be as produced. In this case, um, the actual delivery is settled and the imbalance risks are for the party uh, who's taking 
uh, the energy. The pricing of these types of power purchase agreements is often based on forward price, price as published on exchanges such as the uh, ICE index, for example. And then at that price, a discount is given on the end of day settlement for the corresponding years. And uh, that uh, discount is based on the profile and imbalance correction that uh, RVO applies annually for the, uh, the subsidies, the SDA. Also commonly used are fixed prices for fixed periods. For example, a fixed price for 5, 10 or 15 years. And here you see that the prices decrease um, as the period increases. Yeah, so on the left chart, um, you see uh, an example of fixed prices for fixed periods. And in the right chart, you see the ICE index forward prices for the calendar years where the discount um, is, is calculated on the price. Yeah? So there's quite some differences in which way uh, PPA prices uh, of PPAs can be priced. And it can offer um, advantages both for the uh, producer of the renewable energy, but also for the offtaker of the renewable energy. Another way to optimize is on the spot market. Solar wind farms typically uh, utilize curtailment for this purpose. And nowadays also batteries are being uh, placed at solar and wind parks. Well, the principle for curtailment is simple. You sell your electricity a day ahead on the uh, apex spot. And when the imbalance prices for taking delivery are negative on the day itself, you switch off your wind or solar farm and get paid again. So you actually get paid twice um, and in this chart you see the production of a solar park on june 3rd and the imbalance regulation capacity by tenant that's on the left uh, chart and uh, you also see in the right chart the apex spot prices and the realized imbalance prices that uh, occurred that day yeah? so you see uh, quite some large peaks uh, towards the end of the day and yeah, in this table for uh, June 3rd, I calculated the revenues based on the day ahead prices as published on the APEX spot. And uh, also the revenues on the imbalance markets if the solar park had curtailed during all the quarters when the imbalance price for taking liberty was negative. Uh, so what you do, you uh, sell your electricity on the day ahead and uh, the day itself when the imbalance prices are negative you just shut down the uh, solar park now in practice uh, this does not happen as uh, i did in this uh, table because it's way too much regulation but uh, it's uh, the point is to provide an explanation on how, on how this uh, works well in this case you see that solar park would have earned 170 euros on the day ahead. And it also could have earned an additional 96 euros by curtailing during all the quarters with negative prices. So that's a surplus of almost 60% in addition to the revenues selling on the the head market. It doesn't go forward, but, uh, No, my slides. No. Jan Willem, can you can you still hear us, Jan Willem? Hello. The connection is slow, Jan Willem. 
Yeah. Um, so thank you. Well, this is a lot. Um, what I wanted to do that uh, also. I'm not sure, Jan Willem, if if the connection problem is on our side or on your side, but uh, I was not able to hear you very well. I'm checking with my colleague Bo. Is shall we go okay. one slide back? Yeah, it. yeah, thank you. It seems that I lost the control. Uh, what did you hear for the for... What was the last you heard from me? I think um, even one more slide back. Yeah, if you end up with the conclusion here that the revenues on the day ahead was 170 and then the revenues of the curtailment were 96. That's the last thing I heard. Okay, there we go. Yeah, okay. Well, it's a, it's a surplus of almost uh, 60% in addition to the uh, day ahead uh, revenues. So um, next slide, please. Yeah. So this was the front page news last Monday in uh, Twinshield Dagblad. It, it concerns congestion and companies' uh, reluctance to provide flexibility to the, tier, the DSO, so the grid operators. But it also mentions a solar park that signed a capacity limiting uh, contract, so a capaciteitsbeperkend contract with uh, the DSO, the grid operator, to get a connection. Um, the limitation applies to the months from April till August for the hours 11 till uh, 15. So for sunny hours a day during the sunniest months of the year. Um, now, I took the hourly production from an existing solar park and look at the effect of this and uh, well the results uh, surprised me and they may also surprise uh, you next slide please now over the past three years so from 2020 till 2022 uh, this park produced it's a small park uh, 774 megawatt hours and in the months from April through August between 11 and 15, um, the congestion laws uh, or the limitation from the capacity uh, contract uh, would have added up to uh, 64 megawatt hours. So the, uh, in terms of megawatt hours, uh, the energy loss is 8.6%. Uh, now, um, because prices in 2022 were very high, um, I looked at the period from April 1st, 2021 through uh, March 31st uh, of 2022, uh, which also have some high prices, um, and calculated the financial loss of not producing uh, in those months and those hours. And the financial loss is about 14.4%. Uh, and that's primarily due to the uh, relatively higher prices already in that in that period because prices um, yeah already went up uh, in May and June of that year. Um, but if the projected production uh, were to be sold on the day ahead, and the electricity itself, which cannot be uh, put onto the grid. Um, the solar park was shut down in those four hours. Uh, you have to buy the uh, not produced energy on the imbalance market or on the intraday market. Um, and then, in that case, if you would have taken it all from the imbalance market, the financial difference would only be 12.5%. Now, there are also some other uh, possibilities, um, like uh, not bidding on the Apex spot day ahead at all, but producing and selling it all on the imbalance market, uh, or uh, buying the differences in those four hours a day on the uh, intraday market. Uh, but I will not discuss them for now. For that, you have to come to the event on the 29th 
So, um, any questions? Next slide, please, Bo. Thanks, uh, Jan Willem. Um, let me see, are there any questions coming in? In the meantime, else I, I forgot that the introduction of the webinar, maybe to uh, bring up uh, a slide question, Bo, if we can still do that, uh, to get a little impression of the audience that is taking part in this webinar. Can we bring up that slide of question in the meantime? Yeah. So maybe if you can all participate in this uh, poll question to see a little bit about your background, please make a selection of what your background is. Are you a developer EPC or a utility IPP asset owner? Maybe an energy trader already, or you're using energy trading uh, providers uh, or your uh, platform, representing a platform, or maybe somebody else. Maybe let's see what the poll results will bring. Can we bring up the results? So, wow. Oh, that's very interesting. 52% of the people participating in this webinar are older than developer EPC, utility. Uh, there's a very small amount of energy traders or energy trading service providers. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, anyone with a question, you can bring up that question through the, uh, the, the, the menu. Do we see any questions coming in? Um, there is a question. What is your expectations? What are your expectations of the development of the imbalance market in the mid-term? Jan-Willem, can you say anything about that? Yeah, for the midterm, if we look at the period from now till, let's say, um, 2028, eh, so five years, that's uh, quite a midterm. Um, due to the uh, increase of solar and wind production, but also the change in our consumption by adding more uh, electric vehicles, adding more heat pumps, uh, electrifying industry, etc. Um, and not having all those batteries in the grid yet. Um, I think that the imbalance uh, volatility, if possible, will even uh, increase further, uh, but also the price spreads. So the minimum um, imbalance prices and also the maximum imbalance prices on the uh, imbalance market will also uh, increase. And I think only on the longer term, um when we have more hydrogen uh production and we have more batteries uh in the grid uh it will ease down again so for the midterm i would say uh, imbalance prices and volatility will continue to increase which means that also then revenues to be made will increase so yes if you yeah if you anticipate uh correctly then you will uh, certainly uh, be able to earn more money on the uh, imbalance market. Yeah. And, and, and can you say anything about how many or which percentage of the market, the, the asset owners, your estimate, are already active on the imbalance market? So the, the, the solar asset owners. Uh, very good question. Also, Frank Boerman from Tenet uh, asked me that about a week and a half ago. And my uh, guesstimate. Uh, was about uh, 500 megawatts of uh, solar capacity, yeah. uh, mainly the larger uh, solar parks, but also larger rooftop uh, plants uh, already making use of uh, curtailment. Um, yeah, I think uh, offshore wind uh, will even be more uh, in megawatts, uh, but I had to guess. Uh, but 500 megawatts. 500 megawatts also a guesstimate, uh, but it's I think uh, compared to the load we have in the Netherlands, it's still uh, and also the installed capacity, it's still a small number. Yeah. Uh, although okay. 500 megawatts sounds a lot. Yeah. No, but compared to the the gigawatts that are that have been installed, uh, that's a small percentage. Okay, looking at the yes. time, uh, I see some interesting questions coming in. But we'll save them for the, the end of the, the show uh, for the Q&A. Thanks, Jan Willem. And uh, let's continue with Thank the you. next speaker. And um, here we go with Tim De Kneft, he's CEO and Executive Director of Distro Energy. 
is responsible for investment, treasury and subsidiary activities of the Port of Rotterdam, board member at several global institutions, involved in local peer-to-peer -peer and predictive trading. Welcome, Tim. Um, you're there. Are we starting with a slide or question from your side? Yes. Bo, if we can bring up the, the slide or question from uh, Tim. Welcome this morning. You've been listening to the presentation of Jan Willen. Any surprises to you? No, nothing. Nothing to, that's that's very surprising. I think uh, Jan Willem and I uh, speak to each other uh, frequently, so in that sense, I've uh, I know I know the I know the storyline. Okay, so your uh, poll question: How much of Europe's energy uh, you think comes through from the Netherlands? So, interesting question. If you select, uh, do you think it's less than five percent, or between ten and fifteen percent, or even more than fifteen percent of Europe's energy coming? through uh, through the Netherlands. Okay, can we have your votes? And if you make a quick vote, then we can bring up the results and see, well, Tim, I'll give you the floor and then you can all immediately respond to this uh, outcome of this uh, poll question. I'll, 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 I'll keep my, uh, my answer until uh, one of the latest slides in the presentations, but uh, very, very nice to see uh, uh, the, the kind of diverse uh, results in uh, in the poll. Uh, let's see if I can. Does it work? If I so, what I'll what I'll be talking to you guys about today is the is the importance of uh, local local energy trade and and what it does and and how it supports the the challenges that we see uh, uh, today and and also in the foreseeable future, as uh, as Jan Willem was uh, was mentioning in his. Uh, in his answer to uh, to one of the one of the questions. There we go. So what I'll start I'll first start off with is that what we what we've seen so far the last uh, the last kind of couple of years is we've only seen the first real negative effects of the transition. And we see a lot of uh, a lot of the activity moving from a centralized manner to a decentralized manner. Traditional generation to renewable generation uh, from a, a fixed fixed contracts to more flexible contracting and, and that leads to several types of obstacles and we see grid instability grid congestion volatile markets and physical limitations and i think they are they're not just visible in the netherlands they're also visible in other countries around the around the globe but i think in the netherlands uh, they um they given the fact of how kind of relatively limited the amount of spaces and how much activity is taking place uh, you do see the the effects uh, quite uh, quite enlarged and there are several types of solutions uh, on the one hand you have the the physical solution which is more related to the smart grids to more cable and in that sense you uh, you, you you kind of uh, look at more technical technical solutions and then the other one is very much around kind of behavioral change and you it, it's it's all around markets and uh, and and what is all aimed towards is to increase the the flexibility of, of users uh, producing the, the consumers but also but also the parties that um, uh, that, uh, that 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 provide storage and, and flex assets on the on the grid as as uh, the, the the poll the poll was all around the, the question of how much of the energy flows through through the Netherlands or how much of European energy flows through the Netherlands and what you see here is the is the flow uh, of how much energy flows through the port of Rotterdam towards the rest of uh, the rest of Europe. Uh, obviously, it's not the whole of the, of the Netherlands, but it's a is a good portion of the of the Netherlands, and and this equates to roughly 14% of uh, of European energy flows. And just to give you a bit of a uh, bit of perspective on the the 8,800 8, petajoules in and out on the left. If you if you kind of would compare that to the to the total capacity of uh, of Penn's grid. Uh, in the Netherlands and and Germany, uh, you you would uh, Tenet's grid roughly is capable to handle 250 petajoules, uh, where uh, where we see roughly 8,800 petajoules coming in and out of Rotterdam on an on an annual basis. Obviously, not everything is electricity uh, because that that would be uh, uh, that would be impossible. Uh, but roughly 50% of that is in uh, in oil form, 40% is gas, and roughly 10% is uh, is other, including uh, including electricity. Some of it is used in the in port in the port area itself, but a lot of it is uh, is moving towards the hinterland. 
Uh, and, and as I was mentioning, most of it is in in gas and in oil form as we uh, as we speak. So mostly in the, in molecules, uh, and that a lot of that still needs to be electrified over time. And those are the two. There's two main solutions in that sense to uh, to the um, energy transition and the reduction and the decarbonization of the industry. One is electrification. The other one is is moving towards different uh, different fuels and and feedstock. So what we see is and what we've seen the last year during the during the Ukraine and Russia Russia crisis uh, quite a quite a few uh, spikes and, and very volatile behavior in the in the last year especially if you compare it to uh, 2019 that uh, we have kind of uh, relaxed a little bit in, in 2023 if you compare it to 2022 but as I was just explaining that we are only at the start of the energy transition and we've only kind of really started beginning the the real volatility in prices uh, it will, will come uh, in the next uh, couple of years, which is which is also in line with what uh, Jan Willem was saying, especially on the on the midterm, and that is the that is the case. Uh, and if we want to have it uh, kind of relaxed uh, afterwards, then there's quite a few things that need to uh, need to be in place for us to uh, to be able to come back to relatively relative normality in that um, in that sense. But it's not it's not it's not just a uh, the financial aspects that are that are limiting what we what we do uh, a lot of the limitations are also on the on the physical restrictions right now as i was mentioning a lot of it comes in through oil so it comes in through through pipelines and then it's transported to the interland if it starts coming into the netherlands through through electrons you need a lot more land uh, so to speak on the bottom you see that a pipeline only takes roughly 10 meters of soil whereas if you transport it through electricity it's roughly 120, uh, 120 meters uh, that is soil that is being uh, being occupied, but also the cost is quite a bit uh, quite a bit higher. Let's see if I can oh, jump in back. Move that a little bit too fast. So, and and then the other part is that uh, is that. What we what we also saw last year is that is that there is quite a large interdependence between between carriers, especially when it comes to to gas and electricity. Um, that will only grow in the future. Uh, you see here a an overview of the different types of uh, fuels and feedstocks that that flow through the through the port of Rotterdam, and as you can see, a lot more are becoming interrelated uh, when it comes to the production of hydrogen, as Jan Willem uh, also mentioned, but also for instance, production of e-methanol. Uh, the connection to shore power for the ships, the, the truck charging, the car charging, batteries, uh, the electricity that is needed for the production of, for instance, green fuels, green feedstock. There's a lot more interconnecting uh, connect connectivity taking place in the next couple of years, which which also means that we need to kind of restructure the market to to accommodate that. And the way that we see that is that we need we need local markets. We need to locally optimize. To make sure that we, we we restrain from putting too much too much pressure on the grid, to put, putting too much pressure on the on the on the main tenant lines, also on the main distribution lines, and in that sense, try to to optimize it on a local level. And we do that with peer-to-peer -peer trading. We do that with a an optimized automatic trading system and automated clearing. And we use only renewables to uh, to make this happen. And for now, it is mainly around electricity, but also the interaction with all these other with all these other uh, fuels and feed, feedstock are going to be very, uh, very important. And what I'll what I'll leave you guys with here is uh, is the pilot that we did with uh, within the RDM's innovation dock in the in the port of Rotterdam. Uh, obviously, I'll I'll explain a bit more and I'll, I'll go deeper on the on the 29th of uh, of June in that sense. But I want to I want to share with you what we've achieved so far and what the reason is that the port of Rotterdam is so adamant to uh, to roll this out. And the, the, the innovation dock is an innovative makerspace in the port. It has 32 participants. It has solar panels on the roof, roughly 470 of them. It has a battery, and, and and there's a lot of interconnectedness between the participants in the in the area. And we, we we were able to handle roughly two million transactions within a month, where all the participants, the the battery, uh, the solar, they all traded amongst each other. Uh, and they were also able to uh, to have several uh, several benefits, as you can as you can see below. 
by making better use of the, the local electricity. Electricity prices improved for both the seller as well as the buyer. We were also able to enhance the payback period both on the solar as well as on the storage. We were able to reduce the, the main meter use by keeping a lot of electricity within, within the vicinity of this particular, uh, particular area. And we we're also able to increase the self-use of, uh, of the self-consumption of the on-site solar. And we we're able to prove the, the, the use of, renew of renewable energy by track and tracing from the production site all the way to the consumption site. As mentioned, I'll, I'll dive a bit deeper into this uh, and I'll explain more on the, on the 29th. But I think this is, uh, this is more than sufficient to, uh, to catch your attention. Okay. Tim, this was your last slide, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. But maybe just uh, for uh, for the audience, uh, Distro Energy, you're 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 providing a platform to do this kind of trading, peer-to-peer -peer trading, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. I, I, did, I didn't want. I, I really wanted to focus on kind of the importance of the of kind of that local local marketplace, and I'll I'll dive deeper into what Distro provides uh, end of uh, end of this month. But we are a we are a a local a local market a mar, local marketplace that also develops and designs new new types of market structures, uh, including forward trading and all types of other financial instruments to really support this energy transition and to help us to move to this new renewable world uh, and make uh, renewable electricity affordable for everybody, uh, available for everybody at any time of the day. Yeah, so, so just a sneak preview. Uh, I understand you want to keep uh, some of the secrets for the, the conference on the 29th. Uh, everybody is invited to come there. Uh, um, but uh, so what, what is the ambition of the Port of Rotterdam to, uh, with respect to this topic of energy trading? Uh, well, the, 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 main, the, main, uh, the main ambition is that uh, we want parties within the area to collaborate. We see that there is a there is a uh, a big challenge to really make this electrification ambition happen in the next 10 years for the next decade or so uh, that to support our decarbonization targets uh, and the only way that we can make that happen is to is to is to reduce the strain on the grid to have parties working together on a local basis and in that sense collaborate uh, and marketplace and that is is, is is crucial for that a, a high a high High volume, high frequency trading platform is crucial to to optimize on that local level. Okay, maybe uh, one question that is tying into this. Uh, I see that's coming in from Eric van der Linde. How do you see the role of the traditional grid operators in the local energy trading? I think I think there is a uh, there's a a huge opportunity for collaboration because I think what we can do on the local level supports the grid operators. And, and we've already seen that uh, in, in collaborations with, um, with, with, with parties that, uh, uh, that, that operate uh, CDSs um, in that sense, that, that, that there is a, there's a, a large collaboration possibility there to, to also decrease the risks, to decrease the costs on their end, and in that way kind of make things better for everybody. Okay, final question that uh, was come, uh, come in from uh, Frank Boersma. How do you reduce the meter use without new physical infrastructure? Can you say something about that? So we, we, don't, we don't necessarily um, reduce the total meter use, but by, um, but by providing insights on when to use it across the day, we're able to, so it's, it's partly a, a matter of load shifting and, it, and it's showing that if you use it at different times of day, there is a, there is a benefit to be had amongst each other and in that sense, you can create more capacity within the current uh, contract, meter contract, and with the contract of value that you have by using it at different moments of the day. Because a lot of the times, kind of collaborating creates benefits that you don't have in your own, that you don't have by yourself. Okay, good. Maybe more questions after the next presentation. Thanks, uh, Tim, for your contribution so far. Uh, let's move to the next speaker. Can bring up the slide of Jean-Paul. Um, Jean-Paul Harman, he is a director and principal consultant at, uh, at Enepsis, active since 2001 in the energy market. So also kind of a dinosaur, still looking young, uh, Jean-Paul, but uh, with a lot of experience, specialized in short-term trading, balancing and ancillary services. So please 
take it ahead. Uh, I think you also start with the Slido question, right? Bo, do we have a question? Here it is. What is your status with respect to electricity trading? So are you still in the learning stage? Are you actively trading yourself? Or are you a service provider trading for anyone else? Or is there another position you have with respect to electricity trading? I'm very curious, and, and so is Jean-Paul, to learn what kind of people we have in, participating in this webinar. So are you still in learning stage, like myself? Or are you actively trading for a service provider? And the, wow, 67%. I'm not the only one here just listening in to learn a lot. Um, so, Jean-Paul, yes. no pressure on your side, but uh, you can take it away with uh, to help us learn more about the electricity uh, trading. Yes, um, I'll quickly skip through the slides provided by our marketing department. Um, so, yeah, solar forecasting. Uh, what are we going to talk about? Um, the challenges in forecasting. Um, a little bit about how to assess revenue forecasts, uh, also going back a little bit to the case that uh, Jan Willem uh, presented, and then a case study which basically elaborates on that. Um, yeah, so I work for uh, Anapsis, which is part of Montel, uh, Montel Analytics. Um, you can read all about that at, on the website. Um, and this is what we do. So also marketing, I'll just skip quickly through that because we're here to teach you something, not to sell you stuff. Uh, so what are the main challenges in uh, in forecasting energy? Um, so the biggest challenge there is, especially for the Dutch market, but it also applies to other European markets, is poor data quality. Um, so a lot of a lot has been done on making uh, market data transparent in uh, across Europe. Uh, some countries are well ahead of the others, like the UK and Ireland. Uh, some countries do reasonably well, like uh, Belgium, for example, or um, a country like Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Spain, and Italy. Um, Netherlands is lagging a little bit behind in terms of uh, transparent data, um, and that has to do with yeah, four main aspects of uh, of data quality, which is the accuracy. So, is it free from errors? Can you just use it? Uh, completeness. So, is all the necessary data there? Uh, no missing values. Uh, is the data consistent? Is it uniform? Does it not yeah uh, clash with itself? And then timeliness. So, is it there when you when it's still useful for you? Um, so, a lot of this. Uh, has been uh, a challenge and since we entered the market in 2017 a lot has improved but we're still a long way from being perfect. Um, so some examples of this, uh, so there's a, a website com called NSOE Transparency uh, which publishes Dutch solar generation. Um, actually it only publish, publishes the generation of about 500 megawatts of installed capacity. Um, and there we can actually also see uh, power plants curtailing. So yeah, I, I tend to agree with Jan Willem that uh, there's about 500 megawatts of uh, solar actively curtailing in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's quite limited compared to uh, to what we're seeing. But on public data sources, you can't really see it. Um, then on the same website. Uh, yeah, grid operators publish the load, which is uh, basically the, the, the net load on the grid, which isn't a demand series. So yeah, getting to, to know what is the demand for electricity in the Netherlands is quite difficult because this includes uh, behind the meter solar, uh, all kinds of uh, different, uh, different influences on this demand number. So very problematic. Um, so, yeah, how do you model? How do you forecast then? Uh, so there's several ways you can you can still create forecasts uh, for both market prices, but also for market behavior. Um, the obvious one uh, is uh, AI and machine learning, um, because that is really good at interpreting uh, inc incomplete data sets and uh, still making sense of relationships, even though you don't have 100% of the of the inputs. Um, 
so yeah, there's a lot of different uh, different things that uh, that these models can do. Um, is it the holy grail? Uh, it sort of sound it looks like it at the moment. Um, so yeah, everybody's used ChatGPT uh, over the last few months uh, after a lot of the publicity. Um, that's one of the AI things that's that's pushing us forward. But there's a lot a lot of development going on on in the field, and I think um, these developments are just going to go faster and faster um so what yeah what does ai machine learning for uh, models forecast best it's the what it's the outcome um so yeah there's some benefits you can develop very quickly you get really reasonable accuracy uh, there's no real need to to yeah to to tailor um your your data well you have to clean your data set but uh, in terms of uh, feeding it assumptions, uh, it usually does that itself. There's a few cons, um, which means that yeah, you get a point forecast. Uh, you need to get uh, another another way of getting more context, and uh, it can be difficult to trace back causality or sensitivities. Um, so if there's something new happening in the market, then uh, yeah often AI and machine learning uh, deal with that a bit uh, more uh, yeah, poorly than, uh, than fundamental models. Um, and fundamental modeling is the, is the other one. Uh, the problem with fundamental uh, models is that they need cleaned uh, data sets uh, and complete data sets. And the way we deal with that is that we actually create those uh, cleaned data sets and we call them then synthetic data sets or model data sets. Um, as opposed to forecasting what, of course, fundamental models also try to forecast the outcome. Um, but one of the benefits of using fundamental models is that you can also forecast the why. So it gives you a bit more context, um, a bit more understanding on what drives markets and prices, uh, trade signals, and also shows more sensitivities. Um, it's usually a little bit better at uh, things that you haven't seen before. Um, but it takes longer to develop, and you need uh, real experts in the market to know, um, yeah, to check your assumptions and to uh, to feed uh, in, uh, dependencies. Um, so yeah, that on, that on modeling. Um, on the 29th, there there's actually guys doing uh, machine learning and AI forecasting and other modeling uh, presentations as well. So that will be interesting to uh, to see different views there. Um, then looking at revenue forecasts. So if you try to forecast revenues, um, what we do is we, we use a combination of fundamental and AI forecasts, and these feed into our various price forecasts. So the price is what we try to forecast, and then you can adjust your uh, behavior based on what we expect the prices to be. Um, there's a few things that are um, relatively uh, easy um, to forecast technically, I mean, to get the perfect forecast is of course super difficult, but to get a good feel for it, uh, solar, wind and demand forecasting can be done. Um, and those are mainly, uh, yeah, those models. Um, what we then try to do is uh, we've got solar and wind forecasts, we have a demand forecast, and then of course there's a gap that needs to be filled. Um, that gap is usually filled by interconnectors, so import, export, and conventional generation. And basically, the marginal unit that's needed is uh, determined as a price setting factor. So on the on the chart on the right, you can see the two arrows indicating the blue area, which is uh, gas generation, gas fire generation, setting the price for um, for an evening peak. And then on uh, on the bottom, you can see uh, an export flow setting the price for uh, for a solar peak when we have access generation. Um, so yeah, rather than just forecasting a single val value, uh, it's actually quite interesting to provide a range of the most probable outcome uh, or, or possible outcomes and then the pro most probable outcome at the center um, and showing the sensitivities. So in this next slide, oh, it's a bit too fast. In this slide, we show you uh, a wind forecast. Uh, the dotted lines are day ahead forecasts. So basically, before people start entering their bids for the day ahead market. And then the, the light green area is the sensitivity around that. 
Um, and then the solid green line is actually the outturn. So you can see sometimes the outturn completely deviates from uh, day ahead forecasts, but as you can see, it also stays within uh, the boundaries of the expectations uh, of the expected variability. Um, having an idea about where uh, where these sensitivities lie and how uh, they start uh, materializing through the day will help you form a strategy on uh, trading your energy. So you can trade energy on the day ahead market. Um, you can do nothing afterwards and leave it to the balancing market. But you can also, also look at intraday markets where during the day, as new information comes in, um, you either take advantage of opportunities or limit your risks by trading. Uh, so that's a nice intermediate solution, um, which is yeah getting more and more liquid and more and more used by uh, by renewable de uh, developers. Um, now then, all of these forecasts result in a price forecast, and of course you have to run various models uh, to see um, yeah if if visions align. So here we have uh, three or four forecast models running. I think there's a regression forecast, an AI forecast, and, and two fundamental forecasts. And where they all align, say, on uh, the 5th of June, the beginning of the day, um, yeah, you can see the black line being almost completely on top of the, of the forecasts, and also on the 6th. Um, so that where the models agree, the forecast is going to be brilliant um, and where they where the forecasts don't agree it's def definitely good to look at sensitivities because the price is actually set not by um, what the market will be but what people uh, trading in the market think it will be so yeah the price that actually comes out of the day ahead market might be um, well it's always right but it might be the wrong assessment of the value in the market and that is something that you will see back uh, when people start correcting or optimizing their exposure on the intraday markets. Um, we'll get back to that one in the example. Um, what we also see is uh, changing bidding behavior because yeah, there's, there are biases in, uh, in those prices and there are companies that actually uh, you use uh, value-based forecasting, which basically aims to not bid the best possible forecast to sell all your generation exactly without the imbalance, but actually uses the biases that exist in the market to maximize revenue. So yeah, you can under forecast or over forecast uh, depending on what you expect the market to be and where the value should be. Um, oh, that was again too fast. So what we're seeing here is uh, the bottom chart is uh, the solar generation in Netherlands. The top chart shows you in green um, the aggregated revenue if uh, all of that volume was sold in the day ahead market. And then you can see, for example, here at the beginning, um, the first day has a very negative revenue. So you never, never want to be uh, at the end of that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you can also see where, uh, for example, some, some big changes happen uh, during the day. So the bottom chart shows you um, the, the, the actual generation in yellow and the black line is the forecast. So there's two days where actually the forecast was, uh, was higher than the outturn. And that means that the market is going to face uh, a shortage in generation. And that introduces trading opportunities. If we then look at the difference between day ahead and intraday markets, um, so in the orange area, you can see the minimum, the, the range of traded prices on the intraday market. And there you can see that uh, with the solid black line showing uh, the, the price at zero, uh, there's a few days where actually the day ahead price was below zero. Um, yeah, you would, it would pay off to curtail your, uh, your solar uh, power. But if you actually sold that power in the intraday instead of the day ahead market, uh, you could have still made quite a nice uh, revenue. Uh, we'll look at that in the case study here. So what are we doing? We're looking at a 20 megawatt solar farm um, and we're looking at uh, non-dispatchable uh, variant first. 
So this means this is the forecast. It's, this is what it's going to going to generate. And if we um, sell that at any price in the day ahead market, this is the day ahead price for that for that day, which was the outturn price. Then um, yeah, the cumulative revenue is no revenue until the sun comes up. Then a few hours with a bit of revenue, and then suddenly we get into the negative price hours, um, and then. Yeah, the cumulative revenue goes below zero and then in the end we end up at something like minus 1200 euros of total revenue for this for this solar farm of course if you have a ppa uh, this is not your problem uh, necessarily or at least not right now um, but it will be a problem for the for the people taking the power off the ppa uh, because negative value it's value but it doesn't really help you um, so how to deal with that as a trader? In, as a trader, you can put li limit orders in, uh, as described by uh, Jan Willem, uh, and basically say, okay, we don't generate at negative prices. So if you don't generate at negative prices, then you sell the orange volume over here, and you don't sell the volume in the blank area during the solar peak. Um, and that basically gives you the, in the second chart, the, the revenue per 15 minutes, but also the total value of revenue, which is suddenly, uh, say, 1,800 euros. So that's a difference of 3,000 euros for just by switching off or not selling the power uh, of the solar farm. Um, so yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, so you can actually do that. And uh, of course, if you have a PPA partner, um, they may have already been uh, been implementing this strategy of course they will still end up with the power so what to do with that excess power which has not been sold during solar peak um we'll see that here so actually if you look at the intraday prices um and only sell uh, at positive intraday prices in this case the 4th of june for all of these periods where green volume is um, is visible. There were hourly blocks where you could actually sell uh, this power on the intraday market uh, above zero. So that's additional revenue that you could could make. And if you look at the second chart, uh, you can see how much revenue that, that actually was. Uh, we can see the three curves together with cumulative rec revenues. So actually. Uh, the black one is the one with the lowest revenue, with no strategy at all and no trading. Second one is just trading positive day ahead prices, and the third one is, is trading positive uh, day ahead and intraday prices. So yeah, that difference is quite shocking. Um, and since yeah, we already see uh, on day ahead forecasts where the sensitivities are. Uh, so you could actually see on, on the, the day ahead price forecast, which comes from our platform, uh, that there's a large sensitivity for those uh, solar peak hours. So you can actually anticipate um, that these opportunities will actually occur. And then, of course, the final resort is either curtailment or leaving, uh, leaving your power for the, for the balancing market. Um, yeah, that's, that's also an option, of course. Right. So, so what do we do with this knowledge? Um, so, trading forecasting is is very interesting if you're exposed to market influences um, through day ahead markets or through PPAs. You have payers produced PPAs or uh, PPAs in, uh, indexed to EPEX or uh, intraday uh, price contracts. Um, if you're exposed to uh, these influences, it's definitely interesting to also explore uh, power trading. Um, if you sell at a fixed price, um, in this way you can see, the, uh, you can actually identify the value of flexibility for your PPA partner. So that would actually mean if you have the ability to dispatch your, uh, your solar asset, you can actually offer that flexibility to your PPA partner. It might need a change in your PPA or an addendum or whatever, that has value, and that value, um, yeah, if you identify it, you're in a good position to share uh, a bit of that value with your partner, but also get more value from your solar farm. 
Um, then the third thing, uh, negative prices are no longer a looming threat far in the future. They are here today. Um, the market will have to adapt and trading is one way to deal with the additional volatility. So I saw some, someone ask a question about um, interconnectedness. Uh, so interconnectors try to optimize the flows of power with flowing power from uh, areas with a surplus to areas with a deficit. Um, but there is a limited amount of capacity available so yeah that is something that's definitely uh, interesting to keep an eye on uh, but more about that on the 29th of june all right thank you very much uh, jean paul for already a lot of insights and data uh while you're saying that the uh, data is uh, lacking or there is where there's not that always consistent uh data i, I was just wondering um you know this this may sound like a silly question but also maybe like uh, it's it's quite a complex topic do you need to be an expert to do this kind of trading so if you're a solar asset owner you, uh, you've always been working like with a straight sde and now you see these opportunities with uh, intraday uh, imbalance a day ahead market so do, do you need to become an expert to to make use of this potential revenue potential or is this only all, all automated yeah, I don't think you need to become an expert, uh, or, or at least you, need, you don't need to be an expert, but this is a fact of life. This, so this will rule the lives of, of renewable uh, asset developers and asset operators uh, for the coming 20, 30 years. So it is part of your business case. It should be part of your business case. And if you don't explore it, or if you don't find a good partner to help you with it, um, you will lose value. Yeah. Good. So um, we're almost at 12, but we still want to do a couple of questions. If you want, you can stay, uh, stick around for. Uh, I, we cannot answer all the questions because I see a lot of questions come in. Keep them for the 29th of the, the event. Um, there is a question that was asked earlier. So why would you sell on the day ahead market if you know there will be curtailment? Is it also a strategy to not sell in those cases and instead trade on the intraday market? I don't know who can take that question. Maybe Jan Willem or Jean-Paul? I think we can take them both. Yeah. Um, but as Jean-Paul has shown in his uh, presentation, it's also an option not to bid for it, so to have a limit, a limit orders and um, not to uh, be matched at negative prices and use the intraday or uh, the imbalance market uh, to gain additional revenues. Yeah. Yeah. So the you, 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 yeah, Shampo. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. So so and then there's the final option of of just not producing. Um, but yeah, if if you are exposed to the market price you wouldn't you wouldn't go for this negative price of course if you are behind a ppa that just provides you a fixed price for the produced volume then why would you curtail so this it's it's always a balance between uh, the person taking the energy and the person having the asset and 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 the contract in place yeah who carries the market risk no. um there's of course the the dutch energy system but we're part of a european uh, system so the international impact uh, so not only if if there is less wind in the netherlands there's probably also less wind in germany so we're very much interconnected with the uh, with the surrounding countries how does that impact this this whole trading and the forecastability how, how can you forecast that because you, it, it doesn't make sense to just forecast on the dutch market if there is so much happening around us no we, we are not an island so uh, so we have to take into account what's happening in germany and belgium in the uk uh, even norway and denmark where we have connections um, and that that applies to all countries um, the thing we are seeing now with uh, especially in the summer with very high renewable generation is that uh, during solar peak uh, or in, in periods with high wind, um, countries still end up in, an, in a sort of island mode, which means that there are very limited uh, options to, um, yeah, to deal with additional excess or additional shortages in, uh, in certain periods. 
So having a look at what's happening in, in countries around you and how that impacts the flows on the on the interconnectors is uh, is quite important for energy trading. Okay, then uh, maybe, maybe uh, add on yeah, that uh, yeah. because I think uh, th that's the case on a on an international level, but even on a on a national level, uh, what what the solar intensity is in, in in Rotterdam can be very different from the solar intensity in Groningen or Maastricht. So, so in that sense. Also, kind of uh, forecasting on a local level can also lead to quite significant differences in the in the outcome. Tying into this, a very interesting remark, uh, Tim, uh, is is a question that come in like uh, there is this 20 to 40 gigawatts of uh, battery systems uh, being requested or submitted with Tenet. That's a huge capacity. That's also going to have an impact on, I guess, the trading of electricity, the the pricing, but also on the local level. Like if in the port of Rotterdam, there's a lot of energy storage applied that will have an impact on the local trading uh, possibilities right so how how do you look at this future where so much electricity storage will be applied i think um, in general we will see a significant growth in flex assets obviously batteries being one of the flex assets uh, and depending on the on the moment of the day of the activity or the seller of the of the electricity or the buyer of the electricity, the flex asset that is most useful can be significantly different. Yeah, and and how does that look from your side, Jamil, on a national level with so much battery capacity coming online? What what would be the impact on the pricing on the imbalance market? Yeah, I think for sure that uh, the batteries will have an uh, uh, an impact on price levels. Um, uh, if you look at the last 10 years and the development of emergency, emergency power uh, called upon by Tenet, uh, between 2013 and 2020 it was uh, two and a half times per month, but uh, nowadays it's uh, once every 2.7 days. Uh, so the imbalance prices, uh, because emergency power is the, when activated, most expensive uh, imbalance. Um, so those costs will increase quite hard and um, well having a lot of batteries in the system can prevent uh, having to call upon that emergency power uh, so often. Uh, so I think on a national level batteries will uh, help uh, balancing the grid but the main problem is that a lot of batteries are being installed on the uh, DSO level so the uh, regional grid operator and uh, when they uh, react on the um, imbalance prices um, reported from Tenet, they will actually respond on the uh, national grid and can uh, interfere with the regional grid. So on a regional level, they can actually uh, increase congestion, uh, for example, on a, on a uh, winter night where we have a lot of wind offshore production and low or negative prices, uh, but people at home charging their uh, electric vehicle and having their heat pump and also um, uh, are in the kitchen uh, preparing their food, um, then you have on a local level, you have a, a large uh, you can have a large disturbance because the uh, electricity demand is very high from those households. And if a battery in the same system is then charging to optimize from the uh, national grid imbalance prices, then it can actually uh, overload the system. Uh, so it's Tenet says we need at least 10 mega, uh, gigawatts of battery capacity in 2030 where the, uh, the DSOs are currently very struggling uh, with all those uh, questions for grid connections or additional capacity uh, for uh, batteries in the local grid. So I think uh, it can, they, batteries can have a good impact uh, on the imbalance prices, but it's still quite difficult for the combination between the uh, TSO and the DSO. Uh, and Rob uh, published his uh, roadmap for having batteries in the uh, grid. So I haven't 
uh, had the op uh, opportunity to read it already, but I'm very curious on what he uh, is proposing. Okay, I, I think this this topic uh, requires some more discussion during the event on the 29th, uh, uh, because it also the double your opinions about this uh, on the, the developments. Um, one more question coming in, switching uh, from a question from Bart Veldhoven, Tim about. Uh, what are barriers, all the barriers for regulation, in, in terms of regulation, are there any? I think um, there, there, are, there are regulations, or there are kind of barriers for certain activities. Uh, a lot of the, uh, of the barriers are uh, um, that we would need to see covered, are, are covered in the new electricity law in that sense, the new, the new energy law um so mo most of it is covered not all but i think uh, that's uh, that's with all innovations in that sense uh that you you want to go faster than then regulation uh allows you so that there, there is kind of some some sandboxing environment needed uh, and i think uh, in that sense um distro together with the port of rotterdam have the have the pleasant opportunity to do a lot of things themselves kind of and create their own testing grounds, where, which is obviously a, a different a different situation to be in, and, and, and reduces the amount of participants that you need to kind of uh, involve in that in that process, and gives you a bit more time and uh, and and allows you to speed up a bit more to uh, to create the, the necessary uh, well, I don't want to say paperwork, but kind of um, uh, data to convince others. Okay. You're you're the innovators. You're a little bit ahead of the of the curve, uh, ahead of the regulators, maybe. Um, but uh, okay, let's. We have to finish. Uh, thank you all for your participation. Maybe if there's a last sentence, why you think it would be interesting to hear more on the 29th uh, from each of you? What is what are you going to share there, um, Jean Paul? What are, else are you going to tell at the 29th uh, event? Yeah, I think I think we'll uh, we'll dive a bit deeper into into looking at sensitivities and uh, price drivers. Um, that'll, that'll, yeah, that will help you uh, find your footing in uh, what to look at in in energy markets. Okay, Jan Willem, twenty um, ninth. What are you going to share more than today? Yeah, well, I will go into more detail on the uh, balancing markets, so the differences between the FCR, the Evo, etc. And um, yeah, more ways to optimize your revenues uh, by acting on those on those markets. Great, Tim. Last words on your side. Yeah, so I'll, I'll share a bit more on kind of uh, what the benefits are for the different players in the ecosystem and, and differentiate there between the the financial, administrative, sustainability, and technical benefits. Great. So I think uh, with that, uh, I hope that we can see you. On the 29th of, of June, I would like to thank uh, Jan Willem, Tim, and Jean Paul for their contribution today. I would like to thank all the participants for joining, uh, my colleague Bo for making and assisting uh, making this happening. Uh, if you want to see more of our events, um, apart from the, the one on the 29th, we have uh, several events coming up across Europe and uh, around the world. So look forward to meeting you there. Thank you very much for your attention, and hopefully till the 29th. Yes, and thank you, Edwin, for organizing and uh, moderating the session. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.